Hey guys, and welcome back to Studio One with me, Gregor. So today I want to talk with you about plugins and signal flow, two extremely important concepts of any audio workstation in Studio One's context. And this video is meant to be more of an introduction to these two concepts rather than a holistic explanation, because that would probably uh, go way beyond what one video can cover. Um, so hopefully this is kind of useful to people starting out with music production specifically because plugins and signal flow, these kind of terms, you're going to encounter time and time again as you go on. But hopefully it's also going to be interesting to some of the more advanced users out there who uh, like to build a deeper understanding of what they're doing. A plugin is a software extension that works inside another piece of software to increase its functionality. In case of audio plugins specifically, these were created or developed to replace, complement actual physical hardware such as synthesizers and samplers that you see standing behind me, compressors, equalizers, reverbs, and what have you, anything that can change or create sound. And um, instead of having to buy this expensive gear anymore, you could just have a piece of software that gives you pretty much the same functionality and helps you achieve the same results. Now, the advantages are quite obvious, of course, uh, especially when you consider not just the cost, but also other factors such as flexibility and mobility, not to mention fail safety. Studio One comes with a wide array of native plugins that cover pretty much all of your music production needs, um, but it's also possible to use plugins of other developers, so-called third-party plugins, which would need to be either in the VST3, VST2, or in case of Apple computers, the AU format. Now, VST3 and VST2, I get a lot of questions about that. Usually you get the uh, option between both with each setup installer of a plugin. And in that case, I would probably recommend to go for VST3 simply because it's the more modern, newer standard. And also it comes with less restrictions when it comes to input and output channel count, for instance. Okay, great. So now that we have a better understanding of what a plugin is, let's take a look at that in Studio One and understand what the signal flow is like. Just to clarify what signal flow means, that is basically the term that describes in what direction the audio flows, or rather the order in which that occurs. Now there's two different kinds of audio sources, or rather three in Studio One. You can either generate sound from a so-called instrument plugin that you find here when you open up the browser, in the bottom right, you can also use F3 on your keyboard and then go to the instrument section. There's a couple that already come with Studio One, such as DMI Tie, and you could literally just drag and drop that directly into your song, like so, into the next available song space. This is the Mai Tai synthesizer. And now these notes are being generated by this sort of emulated hardware, if you want to call it that. You could then go ahead and do a double click here to generate a new part, as we call it, where you can then enter some note events. And this sound that we just generated with the notes that we drew in goes directly into this instrument channel that you see here and also in the mixer console. So that would be the first way to get the audio source into your project from where you can then track the signal flow. Alternatively, we can generate audio through an audio track. And there's two different ways that we could set this up. Option A would be fairly straightforward. We just pick like a WAV or MP3 file from our computer. In this case, I'm just going to go to the Files tab of Studio One's browser and uh, just drag in a sample like so. And this would now generate sound as soon as I hit play, which you can then track along in the mixer console. Or alternatively, we don't have to use any pre-recorded stuff at all and just record something in real time. This we would do by selecting an input either from here in the track list or from the track inspector, which you can open up by clicking here or pressing the F4 key. Now you could click here and select any of your inputs that you have available in your studio. This configuration will look different to mine, obviously, because you don't probably have the exact same instruments hooked up to your mixer or audio interface. Um, but you can simply adjust that by clicking here on Audio I.O. Setup. And once you're here, you can just click Mono. If you have an input with just one cable, like for example, a microphone, that's just one XLR with the three pins that plugs into the microphone and then plugs into your audio interface. Just one input, that's Mono. Or it can also be stereo, like for example, many of these keyboards that you see standing behind me, they have a left and a right, and those would need to be connected as a stereo pair to your mixer 
and audio interface. Once you have that hooked up, you could simply select an input. Like in my case, I'm just going to select the microphone right here and record arm it, meaning um, prepare it for an actual recording like so. And now you could see that the uh, microphone that I'm talking into right now is traveling in real time into Studio One. And this could also be a source of audio in my song. So if I would now hit record down here in the transport bar, you can see that I'm now recording my voice. And this would ultimately end up being a very similar event to the one that I just dragged in to my song from the browser. So in order to have some kind of signal flow in the first place, these are the three methods that we can go for. We can either generate sound by drawing in MIDI notes that trigger a virtual instrument or a synthesizer or something like that. Or we can drag in a sample, like a pre-recorded wave, MP3, something like that. Or we can just record something or monitor something, meaning auditioning any real instrument inputs that we have connected. From there, the audio begins to travel. And this is what I just want to briefly show you. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. And I'm going to show you how you can study that a bit more in depth if you like to in a moment. But let's stick with the basics for now. So we have an audio event that's generating sound from there that's traveling into the mixer console channel that you see here. And from here, it first of all travels into the input controls. If you don't see them, you can click on this wrench icon here inside of the mixer console and then show input controls. And here you get a level trim where you can increase or decrease the amount of level traveling into the channel. And this actually comes before anything below here. So let's say that I would have a chorus effect. I can just drag and drop that from the browser directly onto this channel. You can also see it in a top to bottom order. This comes before the insert effect. So in this case, I would now travel into this chorus with five and a half decibels less level because this comes before the chorus, All right? Now, what also comes before this chorus effect that I just added is this polarity switch where we can flip the face if we need to. And only then we start traveling into this insert effect here. From here, it goes on in a serial order. So if I would have like a compressor and I would add that underneath, first the audio would hit the chorus and then it would hit the compressor. If I wanted it to be the other way around, I could simply drag the order like so. From here, we also have the option to send this audio to a different channel. This is what we call in return on effects channel in Studio One. Traditionally in studios, you would often send any mixer channel to a different effect processor using often an aux and then just send that back on a different channel so that you could mix the original signal with the process signal that came back from this effect rack. This is kind of what we're simulating here. So for example, I could also have a chorus here on the send and this would essentially send this channel now onto a separate channel where this chorus is applied. So this is actually kind of interesting. So I want to show you this for a moment. Let me just turn the volume all the way down because we don't need to listen to this. We just want to visualize it for a moment. Now this audio event here on my timeline is traveling through the trim, through the inserts. And after that, it's being sent over to this dedicated channel with another chorus on it. We can adjust the level with what we're sending to this different channel by adjusting the slider. And here comes the pre-fader on off switch. If this is toggled to the right, meaning this is now yellow, then this level is being sent before the channel fader volume applies. So even if this was all the way down, this channel fader, you could see that it's not affecting the level at which we're sending to the different channel at all. Whereas when this is in the normal setting, then this send level is being applied after this fader, which means now there's no level traveling to this channel anymore. Okay, as soon as we turn it up, now we're sending back into this effects channel as well. Okay, uh, if you want to learn more about that, uh, my good friend and colleague Joe Gilder has shown you what the benefits of this pre and post fader send can be. This is just something that I wanted to mention on the side. So I'm just going to remove the sense again, just so you know, this is something that you also need to pay attention to. And after 
we went through the entire insert chain here. That's the moment where we hit this channel fader. And uh, this means that if you attenuate this all the way down like so, you're still hitting the chorus with the same level, right? If you want to hit your insert plugins with less level, you would need to do this either with the insert trims here that you can once again open by showing the input controls in the mixer console or by simply reducing the level of the event before it hits the channel, okay? From there, we then travel further to the channel output section and we can then assign where that audio is traveling to next and then the circle basically repeats itself. Now, of course, this is just a very short glimpse at the most basic signal flow in Studio One. If you're already an advanced user and you would like to study Studio One signal flow at a deeper level, there's actually an updated and much more detailed channel flow chart that I'm going to link you in the video description. This was made by Studio One user Jeff Petit. I hope I'm pronouncing that last name right. But uh, yeah, it's an incredibly detailed chart where you can really uh, look at all the intricacies of the channel flow and all of the details. It can be an incredibly useful document to study if you'd like to understand Studio One at a deeper level. So hopefully you learned something today, whether you were completely new to these concepts or whether you've already known about them. I still hope that you took something away from it. And with that, thank you so much for watching.